Hello everyone and welcome to CBX. Sure, my name is Sister Lyndon and today we're reviewing uh, Atlantis Square Panthers. So this is the second in the unofficial Blitz trilogy of SpongeBob games, which... Hmm. Um, so, anyway, as I was saying, what... <laughs> what the hunky-dory do was that? Uh, Mr. Lynn. <sighs> okay. How'd you get into my house? <laughs> Bold of you to assume that I have left. Now, uh, we are working still on the Cool Guys Enterprises uh, investigation. Uh, however, as you are most likely aware, they are still requiring you to fulfill your requisite number of reviews for them. So, you know, if you can just sort of do that, that'd be good. Of course I'm aware. I've had one of their employees knocking on my door for a week. I tried to talk to him, but he just kept knocking and staring at me blankly. Anyway, hold your horses, okay? I heard something outside. Stress can do terrible things to the body, you know. Well, I'll leave you to get on with your review. I just thought I'd pop in and give you a little reminder. Good evening, and uh, carry on. Hmm. Alrighty. Alright, listen here, you. I am busy making reviews, okay? You don't interrupt a reviewer when they're making the reviews, okay? I'm armed and reasonably dangerous, okay? You, yeah, yep, I'm, I'm Chester, yeah. Chester. Yep, still, still Chester, I yeah. Was Oh, you definitely know how to make a guy feel special, yes. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Boom. Oh, no. Hello everyone, and welcome back to CMB Extra. It is I, your lord and reviewer, Chester, here to bring you that hot, burning new reviews for games that maybe three of you have played. On that, let me know in the comments if you have actually played this specific version of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, because as we're about to get into, there's like five versions of this game, all of which had like a billion different developers. So anyway, to be more specific, the main developer was Eurocon. The different versions had different developers. So the Game Boy Color version uh, was developed by Grip Tonight Games, PC by No Wonder. Heh, <laughs> no wonder it's so bad. Heh <laughs> mm, mm. No, no, I didn't, I didn't say go, no. And PlayStation by Argonaut Games, with the version by Eurocom being the one used for all then current consoles and is therefore the developer of the version we are reviewing today. Can we just uh, take a moment to, uh, yeah. Appreciate the, uh, the the majesty of these faces. Like, God damn! I feel like I'm reviewing the wrong game here. Damn boy! Damn boy! The game was released in November of 2002 to, well, for once, moderately positive reviews. Hey! Isn't that nice for once? BJ has said multiple times after I finished streaming for the day, "Hey, are you ever gonna play like a good game for once?" And to that I say, "No, BJ. I have a job to do." Game Pro gave it a three and a half stars out of five. GameSpot gave it 7.3 out of 10, GameZone an 8.8 .8 out of 10, IGN an 8.9, and Nintendo Power a 4.4 out of 5. And they've just given a, a 4.5, Nintendo? What held back that 0 0.1, huh? I demand the answers. So the game actually released two moderately positive reviews. Boy, howdy, that's a relief. But, uh, Chester, what do you think? Uh... If you watched any of my live streams of this game, you know full well how my experiences was with this game. But that's for a later moment. Let's give you gorgeous, handsome, intellectual, brilliant, amazing people at home, and not you know, subscribe, a recap of the story of Harry Potter. Not like you need it, of course, but the deed must be done. Harry Potter focuses around Jacques Horror, Harry Porker, I mean Potter, as he is whisked away from his old uncle and aunt and the mean old people with their canes to be taught the ways of magic at Hogwarts. Harry Potter was an absolute sensation. It made all the monies. <laughs> you thought I wasn't going to do it. 
and everyone and their grandma was wondering, what's the point of Cho? Like, why is she even here? Except my friend BJ, of course, because he decided he was simply too cool for Harry Potter and dipped, till I dragged him along to a series of movie nights a few years ago to get him caught up on the series, to which his final verdict was, yeah, it's alright. So there you have it, Harry Potter, it's alright. Now, Chamber of Secrets was the first sequel in the series, returning us to Hogwarts once again. And this, like the games, isn't my first foray into all this business. I reviewed the first Harry Potter game in the series about a year or so ago. You can check it out by clicking the little eye thing in the corner or in the description if you want. I wasn't mm, overly impressed with the game, finding it to actually go against the most important and best aspects of Harry Potter, its ability to tell great stories without talking down to its audience. So yeah, it wasn't great, but hey, we're here to play through all the Harry Potter games, so we got to work out if any of them are halfway decent. So now on to the second game. One, two, three, four. Now then, the game follows the plot of the book, and like the previous game, chooses to, rather than base itself solely on the movie, it straddles the line between representing the books and the movie. Sometimes using areas that are very similar to the movies, other times being closer to the book, but more often than not, doing its own direction, which is the thing I find honestly the best part of these early three Harry Potter games. The GameCube and PS2 were powerful enough, but pulling off modelling characters to look moderately close to the actors would be pretty meh looking in my opinion, as we'll see with later games in the series. Having its own visual style, colour scheme and visual identity gives these games a real sense of individualism, which can be so easily lost in movie time games. Jumping from which source material it's representing can be a bit jarring, but it's nice to see these developers be given such freedom with how they want to represent their concepts of Hogwarts. How they want the characters to look, rather than just, mm, how much of a gap is, uh, does Daniel Radcliffe have between his eyebrows? Mm, okay, yep, right, copy and paste that. It gives it a wonderful freedom that I really value. This game doesn't always look good, but boy does it have a wonderful sense of atmosphere, which is helped by both the absolutely fantastic music and really good lighting. During the day missions, everything looks rather N64 in its shadows and complexity, but as soon as you walk into the dungeons or into even the main entrance area, the shadows and reflections really start to give this game a really nice shine. While we're on presentation, we should talk about the locations you'll be exploring. They are pretty bland, all things considered. There are only so many ways you can make a hallway or a dungeon look interesting. At a point, they all begin to blur together, which is a shame because the visual style does give the game a lot to work with, but it also kind of condemns it to a very samey looking experience from start to end. But what will you be doing in these dungeons and corridors? Well, you'll be doing about a billion tasks for every person who ever decided to talk to you. Yay. And you'll be running around, spamming spells, wondering why the hell is a purple house. There's red, green, blue, and yellow. There is no purple. Sneaking around prefects. Hey, you! What? I don't understand. Who am I? Where am I going? I'm just going in here. Platforming. Harry, why did you go slightly in a circle? It's all right. Don't, you know, it doesn't matter. Okay. Fighting some bosses. Yeah, go. Fighting the wildlife. My one bean. Flying. Oh, you... No. And so on and so forth. The music is composed by Jeremy Soule. To give you an idea, this guy has orchestrated the music for uh, Freddy Fish, Putt Putt, Pajama Sam, Baldur's Gate, The Damn Elder Scrolls Games, Metal Gear, Dota 2. This guy is bloody amazing. And he made the music for this. This is the highlight of every part of this game, every new location, every person you talk to, every event, every boss. This music is absolutely superb. It captures the style and the feel of the music from the movies, but goes far beyond that. He bloody well captures the soul of Harry Potter with this music. He captures the grandness of Hogwarts, the bumbliness, the darkness, the moodiness, the soaring heights of the Quidditch pitch, the plummeting depths of the darkest dungeons. This soundtrack is absolutely phenomenal. It is such a loss to not have him orchestrate the later games in the series. These tracks were an absolute blast and fit the game's tone perfectly. I adore it. You know something else I like? The day cycle. It's so fun. It gives me like some major Persona vibes in a way. I have stuff I need to complete each day, but once I've done them, I'm free to do whatever I like. And I can end my day whenever I like and carry on with the story. 
I wish there was more to do in Hogwarts. After I'd finished my things to do, later games in the series did a better job of capturing the scale of Hogwarts, but they always feel rather empty and devoid of life, and that is definitely true for this game. With more to do, the day-night cycle would have felt much more valuable. I enjoyed the concept of it, but it doesn't stick the landing exactly. But it's a cool idea nonetheless. Okay, so now we've covered some of the good stuff we should... Stop it. Shush. It's time to get on to some of the bad stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, first things first, the voice acting is horrible. I would prefer just straight text. It breaks the immersion completely, from the second the game starts to the end. Now yes, these are child actors, but that isn't an excuse. Hayard had absolutely fantastic child voice acting, who captured a huge range of emotions through complex situations. They could have done better, or at least coached the kids more. It often feels like these were the first takes and first reactions. They are utterly lifeless. I'm sorry, child actor, who is most definitely old than me. Also, why does this damn game take so damn long to open a damn door? Okay, next problem. The sneaking sections are... There's someone around here. No! No! You s no! 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 Oh my gosh! Back to your dormitory. We were so close! <laughs> Mm -mm -mm, not good. You gotta sneak around bookshelves and stuff to avoid the live sight of prefects to get to doorways or something. Problem is, that's no work. The areas you are moving around in are often so large with so many prefects that navigating them becomes simply trial and error and not actually sneaking. You are given no information prior to the sneaking. You aren't told where the doorway is or the painting is exactly. You aren't shown a larger view of the area so you can work out a path or at least see how many guys you are avoiding. So all you do is run into the maze and more often than not get spotted by a prefect that is so far away down a corridor you can't even see them on your screen because you have such a cramped view. You don't know where they saw you or how far through their walk cycle they were, meaning you gained no information on how to beat the level. You just lost and have to reset. The camera in this game is beyond terrible and it becomes a complete nuisance in these segments, where you have no hope of actually getting good at them. It just comes down to luck. You can move up to sides of walls and peer along corridors to see prefects, but with the terrible controls, this is a real chore, and you'll more often than not just walk into the corridor and be seen. And also, because you can be seen while you are pressed up against the wall looking down, you more often than not get spotted by a prefect coming the other way. It is absolute pain. This thing carries me on to the biggest problem this game, and that is the controls. They are... okay. Till it starts asking you to do platforming, which then, paired with the terrible camera and awful jumping, makes this game transform into absolute pain. So, for reference. Oh my... <sighs> Harry doesn't operate on actual 360 movement. He has specific angles he can rotate to. You can move outside of these specific angles, but he has to be moving for that to work. When standing still, he can only face in a handful of specific directions on the horizontal axis. There are a fair few, so you typically wouldn't notice it, till you are asked to jump off a ledge, where if he is facing one tick to the right or left, aka not 100% perfectly straight, you will fall, because someone thought it was a good idea to have the space be farther than the maximum jump distance, meaning even a perfect jump is just shy of making it and Harry has to do a climbing animation to save it, giving you absolutely no room for failure if you are one tick to the left or right, because it will be too great of a gap for Harry to activate the climbing animation. This itself wouldn't be a problem if you didn't give me such tiny areas to move on, making adjusting the direction Harry is facing really tough. Then adding on enemies that you can't do anything about, floating around and causing you grief. I spent an entire hour on this single area. It was so painful because it was so hard to maneuver Harry at the best of times and to be able to see where you were maneuvering him. But then you combine all that into completely unplayable platforming at times. What's worse is that all of this could have been simply avoided by moving the platforms close together to allow for some error, or make the platforms larger to give me more room to do a little half circle to get Harry facing the right way. What annoys me with this stuff is the developers knew all of this. They developed these controls. They knew they were shoddy at times. They knew the camera could be a pain, and they knew Harry had a bad turning circle. Yet they still designed this area and so much more of the platforming to be like this. You can very rarely land jumps without doing the climbing animation. It's almost like they planned for Harry to be able to jump a third further than he ended up being able to jump. 
it feels really sloppy and really frustrating because there were so many ways of avoiding this, but none seem to have been even considered. This game is using the same engine and most likely a lot of the same assets from the previous game. Can't be 100% sure because I played that game in like 2019. But the platforming there worked often so much better than this. You often had larger areas to jump on and the gaps were often smaller. It wasn't always perfect, but it was better. Which makes the design choices here all the more baffling when they got it mostly right with the past one, even if the controls were just as bad then. The game also just generally has a rather frustrating amount of jank. Ignoring the major issues like with the sneaking, platforming, and generally just the issues with the camera and controls, stuff just generally doesn't work as well as it could. For instance, it's almost impossible to not get immediately hit by the Whomping Willow when you reset the boss battle, because the boss starts to attack as you're still fading in. Animations are often pretty janky, which makes repelling spells rather hard. Harry often gets hit as he is standing up because the developers didn't factor in how quickly the enemies attack versus how slowly Harry stands up after getting hit, which makes combat extra frustrating. Just give me some more invincibility frames. There's a lot more I could go through, but I feel like you get the point without me needing to nitpick every single major issue I ran into. The game lacks that polish or even just fairness that would allow me to recommend it, even as a kid's game. It also has some really harsh difficulty spikes, which makes it that much harder to recommend for kids. I feel like I need to bring up this point for all of these videos, but these shouldn't just be considered kids games. They're rated E for everyone and should be enjoyable and accessible to everyone. Easy enough for kids with moments of challenge so it isn't a bore, with a story and voice acting that doesn't talk down to kids. Often games fail on so much of this that they can only be considered kids games. Only enjoyable for those who really don't know better. This game so often dips into straight unfairness that I can't even call it a kid's game. It will just frustrate and annoy most of them. Older kids will get frustrated by the voice acting and badly designed segments. Younger kids won't be able to get very far in it without help. And it lacks so much of that Harry Potter identity that older fans really won't be able to enjoy it either. I'd honestly just recommend listening to the soundtrack as it is the best part of the game. I'd even recommend playing the first game in the series as it lacks some of these more frustrating elements. I feel like that's what it comes down to in this game. It has its positive aspects, but it has so much that's just really frustrating. Maybe the controls are better on the PS2 version, but this game was just an absolute struggle when it came to just straight gameplay and maneuvering the characters when you aren't just running around the overworld. But when you were expected to complete a level, the camera was frustrating. Moving Harry felt like you were controlling a jelly tank. The platforming is practically broken and the sneaking gives you no ability to grow or improve at it because you were so rarely given information to help you improve or show you how you failed. The difficulty will spike constantly. The game is full of janky aspects and baffling design choices, and it really has no clear audience when you take into consideration its often unfairness and level of jank. If you're writing an angry comment at the moment, please try to look past your nostalgia with this one. Nostalgia is the bane of all honest criticism. Try to look past it, and you'll see a pretty trashy game here. I really couldn't bear to play much more of it. I wanted to enjoy it, there were some good aspects, but its mechanical flaws made an absolute chore. I don't know what Nintendo Power was playing, but sure as hell wasn't this. Um, hello. Hello. How, how can I help you? Yes, aren't you supposed to be reviewing a game for us? I mean, for uh, a Cool Guy Enterprises? The, the due date was pretty soon, I think, if I remember your contract, which I thought I brought with me. Uh, yes. Um, well, I mean, there's a there's sort of a snake in my office. There's not much I can really do about that, maybe. I don't think you understand the gravity of this whole situation. The thing is, though, I don't remember signing any type of contract. I mean, they asked me for a couple hundred dollars as in like repair fees, but I didn't sign any contract. They just asked me for the money. Well, yes, it's it's under investigation uh, as as Cool Guy Enterprises, so I, I can't really. Funny, so I can't look at this contract I apparently signed. <sighs> You're making this very, very tricky for me. We're going to have to reset. I 
again.